You know, because people uh, falsely accuse God all the time. And I know he's big enough. He doesn't really need me to defend him. He can take care of himself. I'm not doing it because I have to. I'm doing it because I want to, praise the Lord. He's my daddy, and I'm going to stand up for him. Hallelujah. If people said bad things about my natural father that weren't true, I would say, no, you don't know my father like I know my father. He could never do those things. Well, that's what I'm saying. People that accuse God, they don't know him like I know him. Praise the Lord. You want face-to-face -face intimacy with God. And by willingly showing him what is in your heart because you trust him. That's really what intimacy is. He sees it anyway. But there's something special. I, I can't really explain it. But when you say, Lord, I want you to see, here's what I want you to see, but here's what's actually there. And I want you to, I, I can't move it over there in my own power, in my own abilities. And Daddy, I'm asking you to help me move it towards that because I trust you. I trust that even though you see those things, you're still going to love me. You're still going to be for me. And you're going to help me be all that you have created me to be. That's the kind of daddy that we serve. And he'll never fail and never let you down. Great is his faithfulness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when we're talking about the book of Job, I got to tell you this. I say it rivals and maybe surpasses the book of Revelation in being incorrectly taught. Uh, it's probably the most mistaught book in the Bible, but not at Words of Life Church. Hallelujah. So we kind of, it requires a little bit of introductory teaching before we begin. And we'll start with Proverbs 26, 2. Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. Or the King James says, a curse causeless shall not come. So when you see a curse, there's a cause for it. Uh-oh. And it's not God that's doing it. It means there's an opening somewhere for the devil who kills, steals, and destroys. And the book of Job is not in the Bible to see just how much a man can take. I, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. It's in there so that we see what causes trouble to come, what you do to invite trouble into your life, and then what you do to get rid of it. You think that'd be pretty valuable, don't you agree? Amen. So that's what we're going to do. Because it stems mostly from people who misquote and misunderstand 2 Timothy 3.16 by saying or believing that all Scripture is inspired of God. It doesn't say that. It says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So let's just look at that. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God inspired the writers to write down the words as he gave them to them. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Hallelujah. So, so it's given by inspiration of God, but not all scripture is inspired of God. Well, Pastor David, what do you mean by that? Well, the recording of what happened was given by the inspiration of God. But things that people said and did in the Bible were not inspired. Some were not inspired of God. Amen? Just like, you know, oh, something happened bad. This child got molested, but God's in charge of everything. Therefore, you know, no. He, gave, he put us in charge. Hallelujah. So, <clears throat> Not every person in a given account who committed an act or made a statement was necessarily inspired of God to do or to say 
what they did. God inspired the writer to record the truth of what happened. Some of the things, some of the people did right. Some of them did wrong. That's how we learn what is right and what is wrong when he gives us the principles in the New Testament. So when the serpent, the devil in the form of a serpent in Genesis said, thou shalt not surely die, he was not inspired of God to say that. Amen. If you believe that, then you're going to let the devil be your teacher. He's not my teacher. He's the father of all lies. The writer, Moses, was inspired of God to write the truth that the serpent said that. Ananias and Sapphira were not inspired of God to say, we gave the whole proceeds of our sale of our land to the church. But God inspired Luke to write down the truth of what happened. Here's what the Pharisees said about Jesus, Matthew 12, 24. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, they were talking about Jesus, it is by, only by Beelzebub, the prince of demon, that this fellow drives out demon. They were not inspired of God to falsely uh, accuse the son of the living God. Hallelujah. So, but God inspired Matthew to record it exactly as it happened. So, do we want to follow the Pharisees' example? No, if we do, we go into a ditch, the Bible says. Do we want the Pharisees to shape our perception of God? Of course not. So, please be advised, Job did a lot of talking and said a lot of things that were not true, and he was not inspired of God to do so. It reminds me of the movie, The Wizard of Oz. When the scarecrow wanted a brain, and Dorothy said, well, if you don't have a brain, how come you, you can talk? And he says, well, some people without brains do quite a bit of talking. <laughs> and you'll find that in the Bible as well. Job had his mind upside down, ignorant of the things of God, and he said things that were not correct. And he's, see, you let Scripture interpret Scripture. We don't want his words of ignorance to shape our perception of God. Amen. We want that which lines up with the big picture. Now, if Jesus is doing the talking, you could take it to the bank. Hallelujah. So this should cause us then to follow the advice of Paul that he gave to Timothy. 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not be ashamed. If you don't rightly divide the word of God, you're going to be ashamed. You might do things like falsely accuse God, especially if you're a preacher. That's like the worst thing. You have to be ashamed when you stand before God. He's going to say, why'd you accuse me of all those things in front of your sheep that you're supposed to shepherd and lead them where there's green pastures and still waters? A workman needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Hallelujah. So here's some examples of statements made in the Bible that were not inspired of God. Now, so I'm telling you up front, they're wrong, okay? So we should not use these as examples of how we should think and talk. And I'm going to paraphrase just for the sake of brevity, okay? Let's, uh, okay, how about Jezebel? Just take Naboth's land from him. Is this a good example for us? No. She was not inspired. Of, she was inspired, all right, not by the Holy Ghost, but Holy Spirit, but some other kind of spirit. Uh, how about Korah? Moses is not God's man to lead us. How about uh, King Nebuchadnezzar? Ah, oh, look at all this that I accomplished. Aren't I great? He was not inspired of God to do that. How about Goliath? I defy the armies of the living God. Lucifer, I will exalt myself. Satan, Jesus, throw yourself down on the temple. Throw yourself down and worship me. 
Is this what we want to follow? Now, have we established there's people that say and do things in the Bible and they are not inspired of God? Now, this problem of wrong thinking and therefore wrong talking is not just a problem for the heathens. Oh, no. It is also a problem for God's people. Some of God's best servants that did great things, you can find them in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, needed work on renewing their minds. And so do we. You've never get to the place where you have arrived. Here's some examples of God's people who spoke wrong and did wrong. Are their actions our examples? No, but, you, oh, but Pastor David, it's in the Bible. Well, so is the devil, and he's not my teacher. Amen? So again, for the sake of brevity, I'll paraphrase. King David, uh, put Uriah up there on the front lines. Do we need to follow that way of thinking? Peter, hey, hey, Pete, uh, you were one of those followers. I don't know the man. I'll take an oath. I don't know the man. Abraham, oh, Sarah, oh, she's my sister. Joseph's brothers, father, Joseph is dead. An animal ate him. Now, can you see what I'm saying? We have to study to rightly divide the word of truth. Let Scripture interpret Scripture rather than you interpret Scripture. Because if you interpret it, you will be ashamed. But just because someone in the Bible says something doesn't necessarily make it right. Not every word spoken in the Bible reflects right thinking or godly wisdom. The devil speaks in the Bible, and he is the father of all lies. All right, so here's some additional things. The next uh, slide, please, that we need to know before we study the book of Job. All right, so we cut him a little bit of slack because, you know, he didn't have scriptures to look at, but he had a relationship. God tried to teach him, but he listened to people that said things contrary to the word of God. Job did not have the full revelation of God and God's character that is revealed to us in the New Testament in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we have that advantage. Number two, this limited revelation caused Job to say things about God that were not true. It was true that he said them but he was not inspired of God to say them. Does everybody understand? Did I make that link good? Okay. Number three, Satan caused all of Job's problems. God blessed Job and gave him twice as much as he had before. If you just know those three things, you're way ahead about 80% of God's people, unfortunately. But I declare in Jesus' name, that's turning around. Just like a lot of other things are turning around. Hallelujah. So, Job was just ignorant. He started out actually with a heart, with the right heart. He was just ignorant and said wrong things. But then as things, as a result of fear in his heart, and then he spoke it, things got worse and worse. And then his heart turned he got bitter, self-righteous. We'll see all that. That's probably in part two. And he was nearly destroyed for his lack of knowledge. So I don't want you to have a lack of knowledge about the goodness of God. He is light and in him is no darkness at all. And yet God did everything he could to bless Job and get him out of trouble and get his life turned around. But Job has a free will, just like you and me. And then the devil sent some of Job's ignorant friends to speak more lies to Job. God, on the other hand, sent his anointed man, Elihu, to speak truth to Job so he could turn him around. But when Job didn't listen to Elihu, God himself showed up and spoke directly to Job. There's nothing God won't do. I, I love that song uh, about the, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. No mountain too high, no, 
No wall he won't kick down, whatever. I love This is what God did. He went directly to Job. He tried everything. There wasn't anything left but for God to kick down a wall and speak directly to him because of his great love for Job. And he has that same love for you. But let's don't be ignorant of Job uh, or like Job. So we don't have to go through all that stuff. Hallelujah. So, and Job finally came around when he started thinking right. What changed in his thinking? When he changed uh, in his knowledge of who God was and what God was like. And if you want to change your life from a life of trouble, failure, poverty, at all, you change the way you think about God, the way you see God. You see him as he really is a good God. And then everything else starts to change because the devil's not going to hang around somebody who's praising the Lord and trusting God. Hallelujah. God is good. His mercy endures forever. Again, it was Satan that caused all of Job's problems, but it was God who blessed him with twice as much. Job was ignorant of the goodness of God. He was thinking, que sera, sera, whatever will be. If it's happening, God must have approved it. And Job was nearly destroyed for his lack of knowledge. Let me just show you how bad his mind was messed up. Job 1, 21. And said, Job said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. I'm going, I just have one word to say. Ouch. I mean, the guy, what kind of mind does he got? This is someone you're going to just believe what he's saying rather than what the entire book of the word of God is saying, hallelujah. Okay, so now we have some questions we got to answer. Why did devastation come to Job? Now we're kind of getting towards the meat of the thing. I mean, devastation came. Why? If we know the answer to that, we could keep it from coming in our life. Hallelujah. And not understanding the answer to that question is one of the biggest hindrances keeping people in the body of Christ from walking in their full inheritance. And most of the lack of understanding that people have is from bad teaching. I'm sorry to say, but understand, I'm not against preachers who've taught the book incorrectly because the vast majority of them, vast majority, they are sincere and they're trying to help you. We should just pray for them. They're just, they're sincere. They're just sincerely wrong. And their lack of knowledge can bring you down. So a lot of them, they have wonderful testimonies. Uh, they know more Bible than I do. They've helped and blessed many people. So I'm not trying to pass judgment on anybody. I just want to get the truth out. Is that all right? I just want everybody to know what my daddy is really like hallelujah so that means what you need to pray for your pastor and uh, preachers and teachers that you listen to because what they say can greatly affect your life amen so hallelujah uh okay now it's time to hit the book of job to study it let's start in chapter one job one six through eight now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord, said, From going to and fro in the earth, okay, and walking up and down it. Hold it right there. So why, why does he walk to and fro the earth? He's looking for a hedge of protection that has been broken. And so what we want to do is we want to keep our hedge of protection up. Now, verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and is cheweth or avoids evil. We're going to find out by the time we're through why God said that. Now, is he really a perfect in every way? No. But... How do you think God talks about his kids? Does he tell his arch enemy, 
his children's weaknesses. And besides that, he calls things that be not as though they were. And when you get to the end of the book, all that God spoke about Job had become true. Hallelujah. But he had to teach him along the way to change his thinking. Praise the name of the Lord. But here's the normal teaching that you get from that. Um, now, I'm warning you, it's wrong, okay? Well, God just wanted to see how much a joke could take. Would you do that to your kid? No. <laughs> uh, you know, how much would he endure and still love God, you know? Or here's the one that's most prevalent. God will use the devil to discipline oh, us. No. Well, it's true. God disciplines his children because he's a loving father, but he doesn't use his arch enemy to do it. If your children need discipline, do you do it to yourself or do you get your enemy to do it? Uh, it would be like this. It was, let's say, uh, I'll give this little parable. Say my son needed some correction, okay? And uh, I called up, I, I mean, he needed correction, all right? So I called up to, uh, we, did, we don't live far from a, a prison, high maximum security prison and everything. And I called up the warden over there. Hello, hello, warden. Yeah, my name's David Hope. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, I have a son, he needs some correction. Who do you have that can punish him? I want the meanest man that you have, someone who has no mercy, committed the most heinous crimes and no mercy. It takes delight in people suffering. The warden says, well, Mr. Hope, I, I have a couple of murderers. Will they do? Well, warden, uh, will they show any mercy? Well, they might. No, no. I want someone who, no check, will show no mercy. Oh, I got, how, I have Charles Manson. How about him? Yeah, that's, that's more. Now you're talking. Allow him to destroy everything that my son has. Mark him up from head to toe. Oh, but I'm such a loving father. Don't, ha don't kill him. Oh, praise the Lord. What a great father that if, would any of you fathers ever do that to your children? Why would you think God who the Bible says God is love would do that to his children. God does not use his arch enemy. Um, he doesn't want his arch enemy, the most hardened criminal who possesses no mercy, a thief who comes to kill, steal, and destroy, discipline his kids. God will discipline and correct his children, and he handles it personally just like I handled it personally with my own children. Why? Because like God, I wanted to do it with love and get good results and really make it as harmless as possible. And when I said to them, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you, I was telling the truth. In fact, there was many times where I just like, I don't know if I could do this, but I, out of love for them, I did it. And they knew that it was out of love. Praise the Lord. So the book of Job uh, is in the Bible to be an example and a blessing to us. Here's the question. Would you rather read about Job's problems and learn that way? Or would you rather go through them yourself and learn? Amen. That's why it's in the Bible. God doesn't want you to go through that. He wants you to just hear the truth, see how he is, and then walk in it, and you don't have to go through all that stuff. You're, you've learned it. That's really what he wants. Amen? So I don't know about you, but I'd rather read and let the Holy Ghost teach me. Amen? So the book shows us how we get into trouble, and it shows us how we get out of trouble. Both lessons are very valuable to know. Now, that is why the book of Job is not in the Bible to just see how much a man can take. God knows how much a man can take. Why would he do that? No, he wants to teach us so 
uh, we could glorify him and look like him and be blessed like him. Hallelujah. It's in the Bible so that to show us we can trust a good God even when we're, we find ourselves in a mess that was our own fault. That's where Job was in a mess. It was his own fault. But even if that's true, you turn to God, you call on his name, you trust him, and he'll get you out of a mess and put your feet on solid ground and the blessings will flow and you'll be better off than you were before because God is just, I, I don't know, he has no equal. He has no rival. Hallelujah. There's none like unto him. Hallelujah. So, you need to know, God's put the kingdom in you. He's not stingy. He's not trying to withhold. Jesus said, it is my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Hallelujah. Um, so, let's look at uh, Luke 17, 21, B. Neither shall they say, Lo, here or lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he wants that to come out of you so the whole world can see what he is like. Okay, let's go to Job 1, 9 through 12. Satan answered the Lord, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him? and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side. See, this is what happens when you go to God. He automatically puts a hedge of protection around you. He won't tear it down. He wants to give it to you. That's why he did give it to you. The devil, we'll see in the next couple of verses, can't tear it down. And the only person who can is you by the words of your mouth. Let's keep going. Okay, well, back. Uh, he's made a hedge around him, his house, all that he has on every side. You've blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Glory to God. So, oh, keep going, yeah. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, I'm going to put him in your hand. No. All that he hath is in thy power. Uh-oh, what happened? The hedge of protection must have come down. If the devil could have broken it, he wouldn't have been complaining. Hey, I can't touch him. Something happened. He's already, he's in thy power only upon himself. Put not forth thine hand. So Satan went from the presence of the Lord. So everything, Job, his person, everything he had, his body, his life was under the hedge of protection. And the devil complained about it. Then the hedge was broken. What part? The hedge about what he has. Because what was it that he had fear about? What was it that he took that fear that was in his heart and spoke? And that broke the hedge. But that which was still in the hands of God was blessed. And the devil only had access to the part of the hedge that was broken. So, we see what's happened when we're in the hands of God. Everything's blessed. The devil complained. Job Everything he had, the hedge was down. It was in the hands of the devil. But Job himself was still in God's hands. God didn't put Job's possessions in Satan's hands. He just acknowledged that they were already there. They were under Satan's power and authority. So what is it that happened to uh, break that hedge? So... Let's look at Job 2, 6. And then we're going we're gonna to get the answer here. The Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So, 
First, it was what he had. The hedge was broken down. But his body and his life were in God's hands, and they were blessed. Then he got more worried, spoke more. Then he himself, his body, was in the hands of the devil. But his life was still in God's hands. Hallelujah. So, let me make this clear. People who love God and serve Jesus can in certain areas of their life place themselves into the devil's hands. And they do it the same way that Job did. Because when we are born again, we receive protection over our life, our body, our possessions, as we walk under the shadow of the Almighty, as we're told about in Psalm 91. We, the devil, it doesn't that what it says? The devil can't touch you. He's probably complaining. God puts a hedge of protection around us. But sometimes we walk out of that protection. That's why it says we're to dwell in the secret place. We're to stay there as long as you're there. All the promises in Psalm 91 are yours. And there's nothing the devil can do about it. But if you leave there, why do we leave? Because we want to do our own thing. I got to do it my way. I don't know if I can wait and trust God for the good things I want. I'll have to go and generate it myself with my own talents and my own ability. Or I'll manipulate people to work the circumstances so then I could get what I want when if they would just trust God, they'd get it and there'd be no sorrow attached to it. And if we walk out of the secret place of the Most High God, we can find trouble and suffer loss. But we will accomplish so much more for the kingdom, for us personally, and every kind of goal that we have if we'll just dwell in the secret place. Hallelujah. There's plenty of provision, plenty of blessing, plenty of every good thing. There's no need to ever leave there. God puts a hedge of protection around us when we're born again. Why? Because we no longer belong to the devil. And we belong to our Father God, who is good, and His mercies endures forever. And when we belong to God, all that we have belongs to God. So it's His stuff. It's His person. He protects that which is His. And we're in covenant with Him. He protects us because we belong to Him. But He's given us a free will. If we just have to do it our way, He will let us. There may be certain areas in our lives where we're doing well because we're, we have our mind renewed. I know there's a lot of Christians, or you could pick different areas, but there's some that they've got that giving principle down. Have you noticed that? Yet they're in sin in other areas of their life. And they'll sow seeds and they'll believe God. And they got money. But they got trouble in their marriage. They got tr all kind of other things. And until they get their mind renewed on that and trust God for that area, uh, the devil's going to have an open door. Most people have some area in their life that even though their minds are much renewed in other areas, they still want to do it their way. All, oh, this is how God says, I'm going to do that. The, oh, but this thing right here. I'm not quite ready to let go of my way. And the bottom line is in that area, they're just afraid to trust God. It's that simple. The devil can't do anything to you in the absence of fear. And God can't do anything for you in the absence of faith. God needs faith to bless you and the devil needs fear to curse you. So might as well do it God's way. I want everything in my life. I want my marriage, uh, any business, ministry, relationships. I want it all under the protection of the hedge of God. Sometimes I mess up. Boy, I know it quick too. When I leave that, it's like, whoa, 
where's that piece? Oh, what? And what do I, I run back in there? And my daddy always takes me back with open arms, take care of his little boy. And he's glad to see me. He, you know, he's not going to knock me upside the head. He just rejoices in the fact that I ran back to him. Hallelujah. And it's the same for you. Bless God. So as we run back into his arms, we're no longer in the devil's hands. The devil has no legal right to invade God's territory. He can't get in there. He, if he comes in, he does it as a thief. And the thief cannot penetrate God's hedge. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I'm trusting God. I'm not doing things your way. He's not going to hang around. If you're close to God, for him to get to you, he has to get close to God. And he doesn't want any part of that because he tried that once and he got a whooping. And so you just stay close to God. You don't have to worry about the devil because the devil is not going to get close to God. Hallelujah. Uh, so, but sometimes, you know, we don't resist the devil. We invite him in. If we call someone up and invite him to come over to our house, that wouldn't qualify as resistance, would it? Sometimes we don't resist the devil. We just invite him right in. How? By the words of our mouth. It's hard to resist someone when you've just invited them over. So sometimes we give the devil permission to come over even if it's in ignorance. This was Job. He was ignorant. God wants his people to know these things so that we don't make the mistake through ignorance. God wants us to resist the devil so he will flee from us. Now that doesn't mean you're not ever going to have any issues in your life. But it does mean when we stand up with Satan with the knowledge of the goodness of God, he's going to have to flee. That's right. And when the smoke clears, we won't even have the smell of smoke on us. Even when you're in a problem. You know what that means? We don't even have the smell of smoke. It means when people look at you, they can't tell that you were ever in a trial or any tribulation. They just see the blessings of God. Hallelujah. And we break the hedge of protection when we speak words of fear, giving the devil permission to enter our lives. Remember the children of Israel, they're crossing the wilderness, and they said, oh, that we would just die in this place. And they did. They received what they spoke. They didn't trust God. They didn't realize the power of their words. Don't you make that same mistake. We need to know that God has given us power in our words and that God lives inside of us. And when we speak, it's the same as God speaking. When we line it up with the word of God. Hallelujah. And when God speaks, things happen. He said, let there be light. And there was light. If we keep believing something, being afraid of something, and speaking it over and over again, it's going to happen. Whether it's good or bad. If you're speaking good things that lie with the word of God, you're believing the promise and you're speaking, it's going to happen. But if you're speaking out of your heart of fear and you speak it over and over, that's going to happen too. Hallelujah. And there's no one who is exempt from that. We need to be careful of what comes out of our mouth. It, you know, it's awfully hard to speak fear words when you're in the shadow of God's wing. You know, in fact, it's impossible to speak fear words when you're in the secret place of the Most High God. That's why we need to dwell there. But Job, no, not so much. Out of ignorance fear, speaking, and he broke down his own hedge. Ecclesiastes 10.8. Here's what happened. He that diggeth the pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh the hedge, a serpent 
shall bite him. He broke his head, hedge. The, the devil seeks whom he may devour. That means you take a lot of bites fast. That's devouring. And when the more the hedge is broken, the more that he can devour. Job broke his hedge. A serpent came in and started to bite him. It, so this is what the devil does. He goes around looking for a broken hedge, seeking whom he may devour. Sometimes out of ignorance or we get tired. Have you ever been, you're just tired and you're not really, you know, and it's stuff comes out of your mouth and you're like, Lord have mercy, I better uh, change the way I talk and we'll give place to the devil. The Bible says give no place to the devil. If that happens, what do you do? You run to your daddy. Job took way too long. He took like 42 chapters before he ran to his daddy uh, because he didn't know uh, until the end of the book he didn't know what God was really like. So look at Job 1, 4 through 5. I'm getting close. Perk up. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feastings were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. He continually was afraid. Oh, my children, something's going to happen to them. Something's going to be bad because they, they're in sin. And, uh, and he did it continually. And then when it happened, he thought it was out of his ignorance. He thought God was going to do something. And when he saw what the devil did, he blamed God for it. Hallelujah. So, Job operated in fear over his children. He was in continual fear that something terrible was going to happen to them. He not only thought it continually, but he spoke it continually. Job 3, 25 through 26. For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me. That was losing all his, his, losing his children, losing all his possessions. And that which I was afraid of is come unto me. This was his body with the boils. I was not in safety. Neither, okay, hold that up there. Neither had I rest. He couldn't sleep at night. He was so worried and afraid of these bad things that were going to happen. So he couldn't rest. Neither was I quiet. He kept speaking it over and over. So trouble came. What, what he feared happened because he constantly worried about it. Neither had I rest and constantly spoke about it. Neither was I quiet. As a result, trouble came. It wasn't that he was just a little bit concerned. He, the Bible says he greatly feared these things. He broke down his hedge with worry, and he didn't know to run to God. In his ignorance, Job thought God was doing it to him. He was thinking, K Sarah, Sarah. Job needed to know the goodness of God. We need to walk in faith instead of fear because without fear, the devil is helpless. He can't do anything to you if you're not afraid. So we need to guard against fear for the just are meant to live by faith. We can't be in faith and fear at the same time. Have you noticed that? If you're in faith, you can't be in fear. So we need to walk by faith, not by sight, because to worry, get depressed, carry burdens will never bring blessing. Not ever. They'll only produce what they're designed to produce. Failure, problems, and sickness. 
So one scripture and read this and we are through and we'll pick up part two where we really get to the exciting stuff. The fear of a man bringeth a snare, but if you put your trust in the Lord, you shall be safe. That sums it up right there. Fear opens the door to the devil, especially if you speak it. Faith opens up the door to the blessings of God, especially if you speak it. So we're going to pick up and we're going to see how uh, next week how Job, he started out with a sweetheart. He was just ignorant. And then he started to blame God for everything. And the Bible clearly tells us he became self-righteous, bitter against God, and actually told God that his righteousness was greater than God's. That's not going to work out very well when you do that. that. That doesn't work. After you treated me so bad, I kept loving you, even though you were treating me so bad. I don't recommend that. Amen. It's like when even though I disobeyed, you kept loving me. And thank you. And I'm running to you to serve you. Hallelujah. Well, that's my story. And I'm sticking to it. It's not the most exciting, but it's the most important message that you could have because I don't want your your hedge of protection broken I want to see you uh, I want the devil to be complaining about how he can't touch you all right so let's pray together father we come to you in Jesus name we thank you Lord you're a good God right now by faith we move ourselves into the secret place of the most high God and we declare and decree and we see ourselves under the, your hedge of protection around us. And Lord, we say we trust you. Help us to see you the way that you really are. How you're always for us, never against us. And you just want to bring good things into our life. Help us to stay on the path that you have for us. Because everything good and everything we'll ever need or even desire you've already laid up in heaven for us. Help us to move them by faith into this life that you might be glorified and we will fulfill our kingdom destiny. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name and all the people said in agreement, amen and amen.